I grew up just outside of the city of Chicago, and I moved to Boston in 2000, where I still live. I moved there to attend college and get a degree in hand drumming, of all things. Anyone else here have a, a hand drumming bachelor's? So it's, it's just me then, okay, all right. I was following this dream that I had of the time of being a touring musician. I wanted to travel the world with some famous band, spending every night of the week in a different city, playing to crowds of thousands. I remember in particular this moment that was my last semester at school when I spent so much time trying to imagine the path in front of me, a path that was so unclear. And one morning, just towards the end of that semester, I stumbled into a classroom where two of my professors, hand drumming teachers, were talking to each other. One of them was talking with the other about his schedule. He had just come back the night before from a two-week concert tour of Morocco, playing with some incredible Middle Eastern band. And that afternoon, he was headed off for another four-week tour of Europe, playing with a group called Simon and Garfunkel. Oh, you've heard of them? <laughs> yeah, me too. He pointed to his suitcase that was sitting there open in the corner of the room, and I remember looking at the suitcase and almost being jealous of it that it got to go on this tour with him. It was this incredibly tangible symbol of success, of this life on the road. This guy was living the dream, and I wondered if there could be a more perfect life than this. I kind of interrupted their conversation. I said, are you so freaking excited that you can't even stand it? And I asked it just like that, with no chill. But he just kind of looked at the ground and he looked back at me and he, he shook his head as he said, you know, man, I just want to go home and see my kid. He lived in Ohio at the time and commuted every week to Boston for his regular teaching job when he wasn't on the road. And I, I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't say it, but, but what I thought, what I just thought inside was, surely, surely your kid is not as cool as Simon and Garfunkel. <laughs> but I was embarrassed by how tone deaf I'd been to this conversation that they were having in front of me. Just a moment of, ago, that suitcase had been the ultimate sign of success, but I looked back over at it and it all of a sudden carried a very different weight now. The reality of this teacher's, this hand drummer's life was much more complex than I had been able to imagine before. This musician knew the value of music as well as anyone I have ever met. He knew music's ability, its power to transform hearts, to bring people together, to heal us when we need it. But even still, he struggled to balance those values with the values of his family and community and a sense of rootedness. Today, my unfolding sense of what true success means, of a life well lived, is first of all that it is a journey and not a destination to be arrived at. And that it is second, an increasing embrace of our values, even in the face of increasing complexity. His conversation reminds me of this poem called Famous by Naomi Shahab Nye. She says, the, book, the boot is famous to the earth, more famous than the dress shoe, which is only famous to floors. I want to be famous, she says, in the way that a pulley is famous, or a buttonhole, not because it ever did anything spectacular, but because it never forgot what it could do. Remembering what we can do in the midst of all that must be done is the work of we, the future ancestors. Rabbi Tarfon spoke of this in his own Jewish tradition in the first century AD. He said, it is not your responsibility to finish the work of perfecting this world, but you are not free to desist from it either. My hope for my days and for yours, friends, is that we, as Adrian Marie Brown says, can attend to the complexity of our times with our best selves. 
that we can root ourselves in communities doing our best to honor our ancestors and future generations to come. My hope for us is that we can set aside the simplistic stories we've been told about who we are supposed to be and what success is supposed to mean. I hope we can set aside the stories we've been told and made up along the way about what our gender is supposed to mean or what kind of work has value enough or whether systems of injustice are tolerable just because they are normal. Growing up at any age is about growing into our values, about adapting to change with grace and with courage, and about remembering what we can do even when the headlines overwhelm us with the list of all that must be done. Now, when I think of redefining success to align more deeply with our values, and when I think of our movement ancestors who lived into the complexity of their times, I sometimes remember this story by one of our Unitarian ancestors, William Ellery Channing. Now, Channing was a preacher in Boston in the mid-1800s, and he is remembered as one of the great founders of Unitarianism. He is hailed as a model of religious leadership. He was a public theologian of his time, preaching about justice and equity and compassion in his own words. And while he's hailed as a model of religious leadership, and particularly he's remembered for his vocal opposition to slavery, for aligning himself with abolitionists of the time, we know that success is more about the journey than the destination. And that was true even for great leaders like Channing. Because while Channing always agreed with the abolitionists of the time, he wasn't always so vocal in his opposition to slavery. The thing was he agreed with their goals, but he just thought they were going about it wrong. He didn't love all of the personalities in leadership, and he didn't love the structure of some of the nonprofits of the time and the movement. And in particular, he thought the whole thing, all of these people, were just a bit too emotional not reasonable enough and a bit too passionate about their work. The problem was that it reminded him of these overly emotional itinerant revivalists that were sweeping the country at the time. Now you all should know that the only consistent thing in my life since college is my job as an itinerant revivalist, but that's okay. I don't take his comments personally. I'm not offended. So one night at this anti-slavery forum, all night, Channing has been going on and on criticizing the movement from afar. And Samuel May, a more active abolitionist, he has been listening to Will's criticisms and he eventually just can't take it any longer. And so he interrupts saying, Dr. Channing, I am tired of these complaints. It is not our fault that those who might have conducted this great reform so much more prudently than we can have left us to manage as we may. It is not our fault that those who might have pleaded for the enslaved so much more wisely and eloquently than we have been silent. We are not to blame, sir, that you have not spoken. And now, well, now that inferior men have begun to act and to speak against what you acknowledge to be an awful system, it is not becoming of you to complain of us that we do it in an inferior style. This is what the kids would call a sick burn. <laughs> so sick, in fact, that Channing was unable to answer Samuel. And he eventually, he eventually said, Brother May, I have been silent too long. I love that this story depicts the very moment that Channing took up the work that would resonate with his future descendants. That's us. It depicts the very moment that he took up the work of attending to the crises of his time with his best self, not to finish it, but neither to desist from it. It was the moment he took on the work that was his to do, despite the complexity of working with imperfect people in an imperfect world and balancing all the other values that were also important to him. I love this story because I have so often been in Samuel May's place. So many times I've ended up arguing with so-called allies 
who agree with my goals for justice and equity and compassion, but they don't always love the personalities or the organizations or they think we're going about it wrong and so they complain from afar rather than getting scuffed up in the hard work of justice themselves. And I love, I love this story because I've just as often been in Channing's place. Too many times I have blamed other people's failings for my own silence and my own inaction. Too many times I've left my neighbors to suffer in my human family for the sake of some abstract sense of moral purity that I was holding on to, unwilling to dive into the complexity of our times. And we should, we should always be careful when we look back at our ancestors with 2020 hindsight, when it's so obvious now who is right and who is wrong, who were the heroes or the villains. But we should remember that the 13th Amendment that outlawed slavery in this country eventually, it left an exception for those who were found guilty of a crime. And then suspiciously, Suspiciously, our country began finding more people guilty of crimes than just about any other in the world. So that last year, in 2022, the ACLU reported that forced labor in US prisons generated $11 billion in goods, while paying out an average of 13 cents to 50 cents per hour. Perhaps Channing had missed that day in the school that day when the teacher explained that even when we have hundreds of questions about how to go about our days, they still add up to something, even when simplistic answers are elusive. We know that our children will someday tell similar stories of us, stories about the 2020s when the world was changing fast a time when a pandemic arrived and not only made visible but exacerbated the inequalities built into our society, a time when climate chaos arrived with devastation in our cities and our neighborhoods, a time when we locked up our neighbors in cages by the millions for nonviolent offenses largely. And they will tell of how premeditated wealth inequality made every one of these crises more difficult to address. I hope they will have other stories to tell as well, though. They will be able to tell the story of Black Lives Matter when people rose up by the tens of thousands to demand an end to institutionalized racism and white supremacy that is so deeply rooted in this country. They will tell the story of Me Too when so many brave individuals spoke up against sexual harassment in the workplace and gender inequality. They will tell the story of the Sunrise Movement that brought the idea of the Green New Deal of building an economy based on right relationship with our Mother Earth when they took that idea from the margins and brought it to the center of this country. Thank God they did. They will tell the stories of congregations and communities like this one that came together to do together what we could not do alone and stepped in to do the work of justice even when the people were complicated because the people are always complicated and came together to do the work and move forward even when the path was unclear because the path is always unclear. They will tell the stories of those who covenanted to never forget what we could do even when there was so much to be done. The work of future ancestors, my siblings, is a journey, not a destination. And true success means increasingly embracing our values, even in the face of an increasingly complicated world. Writer and atheist prophet Tana Hesse Coates spoke of this in a letter to his son when he said, history is not solely in your hands, but still you are called to struggle not because it assures you victory, but because it's what assures you an honorable and sane life. Now there was a time I believed that success was traveling the world with some famous band. And well, between you and me, if Paul Simon called me up this afternoon, I'd be on the next plane out of here. But I know that it's more complicated than that now. Now I know that success also means well, it means finding a way to support your family, even when wages are too low and healthcare costs are too high. 
It means finding a way to make the world better, even when there are more questions about it than answers. It means finding a way to envision abolition of the prison system as we know it, which is something that Unitarian Universalists have covenanted together to do, even when that path is unclear and the work is complicated. Love, which is the beginning and the end of the story of Unitarian Universalism, means acting for compassion and justice even when the people are complicated and that path is unclear. An honorable struggle that Coates spoke of means taking up the work that is ours to do, not to finish it, but never to desist from it either. And so, beloveds, let us live deeply into the journey that we will not regret. May we aspire together to the fame of the boot and the buttonhole never forgetting what we can do. And let's love each other deeply, coming together to build up the messy and beautiful and holy communities that make this world a little more just and a little more equitable and make this life worth celebrating. May it be so, and may we make it so. Amen.